Good morning, dear Thai, dear brothers, sisters, dear friends. Welcome to our retreat, our appointment with life. Thank you for making time to come to participate in our retreat. I know nowadays everybody is very busy. And then to look at so many young friends, registers for the retreat, we feel there's a hope, especially to create a better society. This morning, we, the monastic brothers and sisters, would like to offer a chant. When there's a people chant, then there's a people who listen. So the monastic brother sister, we will practice chanting, and then you will practice listening. This is not a show. This is not a performance, but this is a practice. We will chant the name of uh, Avalokiteshwara. In Vietnamese, they call it Quan Am. And in Chinese, they call it Quan uh, Yin. In Buddhism, we call it the Bodhisattva, the enlightened being who listen to the suffering of the world. Maybe at the same time, we also have to listen to extra sound from the surrounding, including the sound of the machine. It can be the sound of uh, Avalokita also. Avalokita or Avalokiteshwara is um, a being who practice deep listening. Listen to the suffering of oneself and listen to the suffering of the world. Because by listening to the suffering, we can give rise to compassion. That is why sometimes Avalokita is the bodhisattva of a great compassion. When we listen to the suffering and give rise to compassion, the compassion is the energy of healing. The healing is not only physically, but mentally. So by just listening, we can give rise to compassion and heal ourselves. Many people, they are afraid to be in touch with their own suffering. So they try to run away run away from our suffering is the best way you can think of. But if you run away from your sufferings, you miss the chance to heal yourself. The healing it itself is inside the suffering. That is why we have, we have a calligraphy, the way out is in, go inside and listen to yourself. So we can have uh, eyes of compassion to look at all beings. 
The monastic also have suffering, of course. We are just a regular human beings. When we practice the chanting, we also come back to ourselves to listen to our own suffering, to, to give rise to compassion. And then also we are on progress to heal ourselves. In order to heal ourselves, we have to be really present here, in the here and now. Because our mind likes to go everywhere. So you may like, while listening, you can come back to your breathing in and breathing out regularly. You just sit solidly, relaxingly, okay? and um, open your ears, open your heart, so the collective energy of uh, chanting can penetrate it into your heart. We believe that healing can happen in every breath. Every time you take an in-breath, it's a small healing happening. Every time you take an out breath, it's a small healing happening. The small healing make up a bigger healing. Do not fear your suffering. Do not run away from your suffering. With the collective energy, all of us can come back to ourselves to embrace our suffering. After listening for a few minutes, you can feel the healings already happen in you. If you have a family, your father or mother or your parents or your relative, they also in pain or suffer. You can recall them, call their name, visualize them. You can send this healing energy, this energy of compassion to them. So we can connect with our father and mother. We can connect with our ancestors. We can connect with our friends and the whole world. Sometimes when listening, there might be tears flowing down. Just let it flow. It might be the tears of uh, healing for you. Our teachers say, uh, the tears you say, shed yesterday has become rain. We hope maybe after the chanting, maybe one day or two days, we will, with the open arms, to welcome rain. It's been very hot. So please bear with it. Dear brothers and sisters, we would like to begin the chanting. Everybody can stand up.
Dear everyone, and thank you for Brother Nhất Lu just give us uh, three big and very long sound of bell so I can breathe more. <laughs> and I hope you can breathe more. And um, in this retreat, uh, our, our title is Appointment with Life. So uh, may I ask uh, how many of you come to this retreat because you read the, the, the text, the caption. Is there anyone interested in the caption of the retreat? Oh, one, two, three. I think less than 10. So what make you here? <laughs> so you just see Plumbless wake up retreat and you rush in? <laughs> oh, that's even greater. <laughs> and um, in the, in the in the poster, you hear the echo? Uh, may I have a little bit less echo, please? Is 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brothers. Hello. Is it better? Can you hear me? One, two, three. Or maybe I need you to sing me a song so I can adjust my microphone. <laughs> Our happiness is here now. Happiness is here now. I have dropped my worries. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. No longer in a hurry. Happiness is here and now. I have drums, my worry. Somewhere to go, something to do. But I don't need to hurry. Thank you. I feel much better now. Yes, and the, uh, the text we write in the poster for this retreat is like this. Life is something very odd in our known universe. However, you and I possess this art, but yet precious rarity, whether you like it or not like it, your life is immensely valuable. So uh, in this retreat, we'll have five days, five full days until the fifth, and we will learn together many aspects of life. But in this first, very first Dhamma talk, I want to address Life, your life, my life, itself. It's not the life of a student, not a life of a worker, not a life of a housewife, of a doctor. Uh, I think this is because there are a monitor speaker at the back of me. So, uh, I don't know if it's still on. One, two, three, four, five. I need to, uh, my hand to be a little bit free this morning, so I can do a lot of things <laughs> with my hand. If I hold a microphone, I cannot do that. So, I asked my brother to let me use this microphone, because it's like, very sensitive. Yes. One, two, three. Hello? <laughs> it's, it's, like it's better now. So, uh, dear friend, in this uh, Dharma talk, I would like to address with all of us is our very life, our very life force. The life that we all have is not the social life or school life or work life or family life, none of that. Is your very life force. So in this uh, introduction of the retreat, we said that our life is very odd. But how odd is it? This means it's very, very strange. 
You see, the, the life that we have is very strange. Let me make this uh, in a way that we can easy to, to imagine how strange our life is. Like within the decades of technologies, but back then, thousands and thousands of years, human beings look up to the stars and wonder, is there some other living being out there? But yet, until now, with all the technology that we have, we yet found any other life form. Even with a very new uh, web telescope, yeah, very powerful, but we yet find any. So there's the author, uh, English novel, uh, sci-fi author, writer. He's used, he wrote like this. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. <laughs> if we are just the only planet that have lives, Wow, this is really terrifying. What happened to the rest of the universe? Or even over there is some other life form. But why we can never see it? Why can we can never find it? Or why we can never hear any from them? Both way to that altar that he found is terrifying. But uh, this is in there. May, you may think this is it's just uh, his imagination overthinking. But we can take an example. If in this hall we have 1,000 people, and we ask everyone to do, to toss a coin, and we all know the coin have the head and the tail, right? And uh, it's either head or either tail. Uh, is head or tail. It cannot be both at the same time. So it seems it seem like that we have our life or we don't have it. Live or die. And we let 1,000 people in this hall all toss the coin. And the one who have head will stay. The one who have tail will have to leave the hall. I'm not toasting the coin yet, so I don't have to leave. So like this, I put on my hand. Luckily, I have a hat. <laughs> and this is for 1,000 people. One thousand people, and assume that uh, it's fifty and fifty. And after the first row, how many we left? Five hundred. Next time, how many? Two fifty. Next time, maybe one fifty, maybe sixty, and then we have thirty, fifteen. Maybe next time we're a little bit more lucky, eight, four, two, and at last we have one person left in this hall. And it's how it's like normal, right? It's how very normal. Then yes, half, 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 and then we have one. Very normal. But, but we can think a little bit. This man or woman, or any gender that you want to call, he or she or they, they have ten times, constantly ten times, have the head. Every time this person tosses the coin, they got the head ten times in a row. Do you see this is how rare it is? It's very rare, right? But it's happened. 
that we are sitting here in this planet with life. How rare it is. In our Milky Way alone, it's just an approximately number is we have around 100 to 2. After 100 to 200 billion planets. And we, if we want to play this game with every planet, how many times we need to that we have this planet that contains life? This maybe is not the only you know, form of life, but this form of life we have here. You have it, me have it. How precious is he? How precious is he? How many times we have to toss the coin? Consecutive. So that we have this planet and you can sit here and I can stand here to talk with you. So just think about it a little bit. We can see that despite what social um, position you are, despite what age you are, despite what body condition, physical body condition you are, despite what mental condition you are, despite how much salary you have, you already possess this rarity, this treasure of the universe. That's like within you right now and within me right now. So how rich you are. If we convert into US dollar, how? How much do you think? How much do you think? Maybe trillion, trillion US dollars. Suppose we have one. Nine, 10, 11, 15, 14, 15, maybe more and more and more. US dollar you have in your bank account. You already have this, this much of US dollar in your bank account. What would you do if you have this much? Maybe just 10 billion dollars, you don't need to work anymore, right? I will go to Bali, I will go to Costa Rica, I will travel around the world. I never need to work, right? But the fact is you have this much, you have this much value within you right now. Despite all every social condition you are here, despite your man or woman or transgender or anything, you have this. But where does our suffering come from? It comes from the moment we perceive that ourselves, since we were born, we are a big zero. I have nothing. I have to go to school to learn. I have to have the good grade. I have to have a beautiful girlfriend or handsome boyfriend. And I, and I feel that I have something. Suppose that you go to school and you have the straight A. Maybe you have 10. And then you uh, get the most beautiful girl in the school fall in love with you. Maybe you have another 30, 40. And then you graduate well, you go to the good university, maybe Harvard, maybe another 40, so you have 80. And you married, you have beautiful ba uh, children, maybe 100. And you have a good job, earn a lot of money, maybe you have 200. Without one sum of this, you may feel that I have nothing. Without that girlfriend, you may think that my life is nothing. So that's why somebody can commit suicide after breakup. Why? Because they feel they have nothing. Why somebody cannot you know, get to that university? They get some kind of trauma or some kind of, of depression 
Because without that university, that person feels I'm nothing. Or without that job, without that salary, salary, without that reputation, you may feel that I'm nothing. But come on, look at this. Suppose you have all the social conditions that you think that's great for you. Suppose you have 200 or 300. Or maybe I give you 1,000. How much is compared to this? It's a minuscule. Even seeing a long number like that, you not pay attention to this number. Right? And suppose you have 1,000 here, and somebody is still all of that from you. If you look at the whole value that you have, is this worth mention? When you have trillion of US dollar in your bank account, somebody is still 10,000 US dollar, would you mind? Maybe not, a, it's just a minuscule. But somehow, we don't aware of this. We are not aware that how much you already have. You have, I have. This much treasure we already have. We start to build from zero. No, you not build from zero. You build from one trillion up. Not from zero, you not zero. In Vietnamese, they have an idiom about uh, tiền không có, tình trong không có, ngồi trong xó. Something like that. It's like you don't have money, no honey, you sit in the corner and your life dumb. Yes, that's what people are talking about. But in that, in that idiom, it contains a lot of ignorance about who we are, who we are really. You're not just a a piece of flesh and bone. Even flesh and bone itself, it's not easy to have it. And we're not aware of this, so that's why we can suffer. We can suffer deeply. We can feel depressed. We, you can feel that my life is, is lonely. It can be a big emptiness. But just with single one moment, you stop for a while, breathing in and breathing out. You feel your breath. Like Brother Cosmos said this morning, you feel your breath, you feel your step. You know you're alive. Just that alone, trillion of million dollars. Already you have, you don't recognize that at all. You take no effort. You don't need to train in for anything. You already have that. But the way we see around us is just, am I better than the person next to me? Am I more beautiful than my college? Am I smarter than my boss? Am I earn more salary than my coworker? That all we compare. And there is, a, there is a Russian mathematician. His name is Zivori Pyroman. He's a, a Russian mathematician. And he won a, a few medal prize with one million US dollar as a prize. But he denied it. After his contribute to the meta, meta field, uh, mathematic field, he denied the prize and he lived like a homeless. And we, when people come to him and ask why you deny one million US dollar, he said like this, 
emptiness is everywhere. And I know how to measure it. When I am I capable of control the universe, what a million dollar matter. He said like that, a mathematician. But he's not alone. In the human uh, history, he, a person like that is not alone. You can see there's so many awakened beings. After their awakening, they live like a beggar. Our Buddha, he lived like a beggar. Jesus Christ, he lived like a beggar. And in Hindu, Shiva lived like a beggar. So many awakened beings live like that. Why? You may ask why. Because they have found something. That thing, even they live like a beggar, own nothing. Everything, even the food, they have to beg somebody to keep them. It cannot cover the beauty of the truth they have found. The truth about themselves, the beauty about themselves, about this world, they have found. No need decoration, no need makeup, no need lipstick, no need perfume. You already have that beauty. You already have that, that miracle within you right now. So they live like a beggar. And if you read all the, all the uh, um, what do you say, fairy tale, uh, mythology, Greek mythology, Egypt mythology, and from any country, we always encounter somebody called a wise man. And how is a wise man, big image of a wise man to you? Somebody seems like always alone. He walk alone, he sit alone, he eat alone, and he live in a remote area. But everybody turns to him to ask for the advice. Right? It's a beauty that he, he don't need to be with anyone else in order to feel happy. He himself or she himself, by their own being, they feel enough happiness. It doesn't mean they, they stay away, they deny the society. But I don't need people to make me happy. I can make myself happy just by observing my inbred and outbred. That's good enough. But somehow in our society nowadays, it makes a person sh ashamed. Right? It's not one person sound like very same shameful. Like you go to the restaurant alone, people ask, are you alone? Why? And you may say, how can I multiple? I came like this already. I came to this life like this. <laughs> right? So we can enjoy, uh, if we would have this awareness, we can enjoy to be ourselves alone without feeling lack of anything. And if there's a friend come, we are more happy. Two friends come more happy. Your loved one, your sweetheart come more and more happy, but you alone, you no, no need to be miserable. You can be happy by yourself alone. Is that, is that a more healthy relationship? Right? Rather than, oh, you're not with me, I'm miserable. <laughs> and when that person comes to you, all you, have, you do is try to, to let person know how you feel, how much miserable you feel, how much pain you feel. And it's the, the downward uh, spiral. It draws the relationship down and down. At one point, both of you cannot bear with that. Not because you not love each other anymore, anymore, but because we cannot bear with that kind of relationship. We can do better. We can be a happy person and be with another person who know how to make him or herself happy by themselves alone. But for all of this, for all of this. I'm just trying to use my logic and information to convince you that how precious you are. Right? But for you to touch your preciousness, you, don't need, you need none of this. You just need to be aware of your breathing. It's very life force.
may ask you how long will you live this life? How old will you die? I don't live. <laughs> I don't live at all. How long? How long will you live this life? Any have idea? You know how, how long? I'm not sure. You expect some, some number? Just leave. Yeah, just leave it now. Just leave, okay. Anybody? How long will you live this life? 40, 50 years? 60 years? 80 years, wow, good number. Somebody want to live longer or shorter? Yeah, we may think that we will live until 40, 50, 60, even 100 years old. And especially for the Asian people, they think they never die. <laughs> Oh, I just asked Asian people, I think I just live. <laughs> yeah, somebody told us that we will die, but in my awareness right now, I don't think I will die soon. <laughs> but the fact is that this breath will breathe out and no in breath anymore, we pass away. That fragile. Our life, that's miracle, but at the same time, that fragile. And we doing our life, living our life, do a lot of things. We, we never be aware of this life force that keeps this body alive. The dead body is still a body, but no breath. Right? No breath is gone. It's just a dead body. But we're not never aware of it. So we don't know that our breath, our breathing, it affects a lot how we feel, how we perceive the world. Suppose there's a, a day, yet yeah, you wake up and you feel your breath is so deep, and when you breathe out, it's so slow. You feel so energetic. Look at everything you see, it's full of color, everything is so, so joyful. And when you're greeting people with that joyful, for sure, they will greet you with the same energy. But when you wake up in the morning, your breath is just here to here, right? And everything can irritate you. You meet everybody with a face like this. How can your day be good? How can your day be beautiful? This breath, you control the way you perceive the world, how you feel the world around you and inside of you. And that's why in the Plum Bliss, and I believe in a lot of Buddhist tradition, we learn how to breathe mindfully. We all know how to breathe, right? But breathe with the awareness that I am breathing. It's something very, very different. So let me listen, let we listen to the sound of the bell and we breathe together with that awareness that how much, how much value, how precious your life right now, okay? Breathing in and breathing out. I feel less hot than this morning. Even the temperature grow, but I, somehow I feel less hot. Because inside of me is relaxing. It's not fighting with the world outside. Just do the breath. So that there are no fighting, no friction. You just suddenly feel cooler. Not 
at all, not one, no, 40 Celsius degree and drop to zero, but somehow you feel it cooler, right? And that is the practice, the only practice, the essence practice that you need to do in this retreat, aware of your breathing at any time, at any time you can. You have been spending 20, 30 years of your life doing a lot of social things, doing for these people, that people. But can we, just in this retreat, five days, we fully give time for ourselves to be with our life, that precious life. Can we do it? Do you want to do it? Yes. I believe if you can do it in five days, this, your life will change forever. Forever. It will change in the way that you cannot imagine of. But uh, as a human being, we easily to forget. Like I tell you everything now, I see your eyes are shining. <laughs> this means something click in you. But I quite believe that after you leave this hall and that start to serve your food, maybe it's all gone. <laughs> and after the, the, uh, the total relaxation, maybe you wake up, yes, I don't remember what is my full breathing. <laughs> I come back to my routine of thinking, of acting, of reacting. So that's why in the monastery we design so many things, we create so many things, many methods, just to remind us about this awareness, this mindfulness. Mindfulness in our definition is that's mere recognition. We just recognize things as it is. No colorizing it, no uh, seasoning it. Just recognize anything as it is. Like breathing in and breathing out. I'm aware that my breath is like this. It's not deep, but I'm just aware of it. I don't need to make my breath deeper in order to feel happy, in order to feel relaxed. I don't need to make my breath slower in order to have all of that. I'm just aware of it. And when you have anger, you can practice to be aware that I have anger. Just recognize there's anger exists in me right now. Just by that alone, we can make the anger grow down significantly. Or out your loneliness, or any emotion that you have. Just recognize it. But no, unfortunately, we, we let, rarely doing that. We always look at the world with our glasses. We wear the red glasses, we see it around, wow, it's so hot. The world is so hot. And we wear uh, uh, sunglasses, we, we see the world is doomed. But just please take off your glass and you see the world differently. It's like that. So the, the, the mindfulness or the mere awareness give us the capacity to see things as it is. No ingredient, no MSG. <laughs> yeah, just think as it is. And uh, we, from time to time, we will hear the sound of the bell, maybe the sound from that bell, or the sound from the activity bell, which is usually 10 sound, 10 continuous sound of the bell, or the clock chiming. This is the, uh, the calling of the Buddha for us to come back to ourselves, be aware of our breathing, be aware of the essence of this life. And just breathe and recognize, yes, I'm in anger right now, but I'm still alive. I am still alive. I'm so lonely right now, but I'm still alive. That value I still have, despite how lonely I feel right now. Loneliness can come, loneliness can go, but this life is stay with you.
And when you hear the sound of the bell or the clock chiming, you may like to stop all what you are doing. And just breathing in and breathing out, aware of your breath. You may like to close your eyes to feel it better. But um, this season is a little bit hot. Usually it's uh, at the noon time, it's 39 or some, someday 40. One of my brother have the clock with the uh, thermometer in the clock. He take a picture and show me that this is 39.5 Celsius degree and the maximum of the sensor is 40. <laughs> yes. So if you hear the clock chiming or the sound of the bell and you're in the middle of the road, under the sunshine, don't just stand there, okay? <laughs> please find a shade. Even the bell is sounding, but please mindfully walk to a shade and stop there and breathe. <laughs> Otherwise, you will feel that this planet will not, is, is not lovely at all. <laughs> they not love you. <laughs> yes, don't make me wrong. With all of the information, I'm not a kind of uh, optimistic or uh, see the world full of pink and every, the cosmos love you, no. The cosmos not, doesn't love you. It just create the condition that you can take this life form. They doesn't care about us. It just create a condition that you can have your life form. If you don't believe me, this noon time, you go there, lie on the, 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 the road, and you feel how much the world loves you. <laughs> and um, if you carry something heavy, you can put it down and breathe. If you're at home, you have with your tele when your telephone rings, you can leave it ring for a while. You just take three deep in breath and out breath, and then pick up the phone. So you. Pick up, picking up the phone with the energy of peace and joy. So the way you react to whatever information you receive, you're much more positive. We're much more embracing. We're much more compassion. And it can change everything. And um, this morning, we also learn about walking meditation. It's just another form of practice mindfulness. Not in a sitting position, but walking. We walk with our feet, breathing in, take one breath, take one step, two step, maybe three step, breathing out, one, two, three, four. Usually our, our, our breath is a little bit longer than our in breath. To just take it at its natural. And by walking like this, you bring your mind back to your body. Maybe you can leave your mind under your footstep. You walk with your feet. I am aware that I'm walking with my feet, not with my head. I'm aware that I walk like a living being. I'm not walk like a zombie. But you, now that you come to go to the world, you will see a lot of zombies. A lot of zombies, they walk like this. Like this. It's a horror movie, you know. It's a horror movie. The first time I went to Hong Kong, I see people walk like this in the, in the subway. And even they take the, the, how's it, the fast track, on the fast track like this. And somehow, a, they're so skillful that they never hit each other. <laughs> but I feel that, yeah, you're very skillful, but maybe I don't need that skill. Yeah, I can walk like this and enjoy my life. This walking meditation is never about how fast or sl how slow you walk. But usually, we prefer walking slow. Why? You can imagine the best place that you, you want to visit in this world. You may have one or two. Imagine that you are in that scenery, full of beauty and wonder. 
Would you like to walk like this? Or you walk slowly and you enjoy the nature, you enjoy that precious scenery, right? You want to walk slow, it's natural. You doesn't have to force yourself to do that. Because at that moment, you touch your very life. You touch the sweetness, the relaxing, the preciousness of this life by your breathing, by your walking. Breathing in, breathing out. And naturally, naturally, you you may have found that you are smiling. No need somebody to 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 make us laugh, but we still can smile when we touch the essence of life. And we can do with the sangha together. To we can get the embrace of the sangha energy. And we look at the people in front after how mindful they are. So we feel that I don't need to take my phone out to take photo. Hi, everyone. I'm in Plum Village. But actually, your mind is with them out there. Your mind is not in Plum Village. So be here. Just do a walking. And capture everything with your all five senses. Not just your eye, your ear, your nose, your sense, your touch. You can capture the world much better than just a photo. And when you come back home, the way you share with your friend, your energy is different. They will feel different. But if you just give them 100 pictures, yes, this is pamphlet, yeah, 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 five minutes, done. No, no more to share. Right? And so I encourage all of you in this retreat, please don't use your phone in our activities. When we have schedule, please switch your phone off. We may think that, okay, I just put in a fly mode or sleep mode or something, but like this morning, we always hear the alarm clock, right? So that is the time for sitting meditation and it needs totally quiet for all of us to contemplate, to focus on our breathing, on our contemplation, on our awareness. So any distraction, you not just distract the people who next to you, you distract the 300 people are practicing right here. So the karma created out of that is not small. So be aware of that. <laughs> Turn off your phone when you come to this meditation hall or come to any, any uh, practice section. Dear friends, uh, let me continue to introduce to you about sitting meditation. When you come to all Buddhist tradition, you see people sit a lot. And uh, what is a sitting meditation? Generally, just you sit and be aware. That is sitting meditation. What you can be aware of? You can aware of a lot of things. You can aware of your of durian, or ice cream, or anything. But uh, that thing is not always with us. So that's why the Buddha introduced to us our breathing. Because wherever you go, is there. And you turn your breath, become the bell of mindfulness. 
to make you uh, bring your mind back to your body, to reunite your mind and your body at this very moment. So you can, can sit with your back upright. Yeah, but your shoulder relax. And uh, you will see that we use a cushion here. May I have one cushion, please? Thank you. This is a cushion. And how we sit on this cushion? We will not sit uh, on the whole surface of the cushion. This is help us to support our back to be upright. So we just sit on uh, a front half or third of the cushion. You can adjust yourself and see. If you sit on the front half or third, you'll find that your your spine is naturally erect. Right? But now you can change a little bit. You try to sit on the whole cushion and feel, start to feel how your back is. Right? There's a lot of tension in the lower back. And it used to bend like this. To change to the first half, or one third of the cushion. It's different. Right. So when you come to the meditation hall for sitting meditation, first of all, you find a place, sit down, and adjust your body posture to find what is the most comfortable position for your body. So your, your shoulder can relax, your back can erect. And put your, your hand, you can put uh, in front of you, the two hands together on top of each other, or you have two hands on the side, as long as you feel comfortable. Or if you have to sit on the chair, you can apply the same method. But the important is your back needs to be erect. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not encourage you to, use, to lean on the chair, because you will, be, you will feel easily to, to feel sleepy. So keep it up straight and follow your breathing. And you may like to uh, do the cross leg, one leg on top of the other, like this. Uh, or the full lotus, cross leg, one leg, like this. You may find it's a bit uh, difficult, but this, that is the most solid uh, sitting position that can keep us to sit for a very long time. Why we need that long time? Because when we can be... When our body can be still for a long time, our mind is easily to concentrate and it has the capacity to break through on our illusion, on our suffering, on our affliction. That's why we, we need to train ourselves to can sit a little bit longer. But if you're painful, it's okay to change your position. But change this mindfully. Make it uh, gentle and mindfully. You don't need to feel ashamed about yourself when you feel back pain or leg pain. Just mindfully adjust it. Yeah. And this morning I found that quite amazing. 300 young people sit in the hall, so quiet. And I come in, oh, wow. <laughs> this is a thing. Sometimes we not expect from young people. I'm sorry, but not we expecting. But this morning is so beautiful that all of you sit there beautifully, quietly. That's amazing. Yeah, or you can sit in the Japanese posture the, with your knee.
you can sit on your knee, uh, on your heel, with the knees like this. Or you can put a cushion on top of your, your heels and sit on the cushion. It also feels very comfortable and keep the, the back erect. Yeah, so I might introduce to you three or four styles of sitting. But for sure, any style you will find you painful. <laughs> and brother, sister who are not painful because we have been painful for so long. <laughs> but it's worth, it's worth the training. Right. And uh, other things you don't need to, to care about. The brother and sister will guide you for your meditation. Just adjust the body to the comfort, uh, posture, but erect, and follow your breathing. And let whatever brother and sister instruct you, you just let it come to your ear, come to your consciousness, like the, the wind flow or the water flow through you. And uh, there's a other practice that we need to practice together in this retreat, like uh, mindful eating. Maybe you already did today, this morning. That in our tradition, even when we're eating, can be a time of meditation. But while we're walking, can be the time of meditation. That's why we don't need to sit for too long. We can this is wrong because the, con the meditation is continued after this activity, after another activity. And in all forms of activity, we can find meditation. That's an active meditation. And when you serve your food out there, you can continue to observe the breathing, observe the, the situation of your body and your mind. When you bring your bow here, sit in the circle, the one comes first, sits inside, and then we fill up the circle. But we're not eat yet. No eat yet. You just sit there, enjoy your breathing. You don't have to wait. Just eat your breathing first. Eat, you, eat your pleasantness of the breathing first. And when everyone together, we, you will hear the sound, three sounds of the bell, and the five contemplation. So we can have 20 to 25 minutes of eating in silence together, really silent. Not just the mouth silent, but the mind needs to be silent. So our, this is the best situation for our body to digest the food. We, you may know and we may all know that digestion, food digestion is a very heavy duty process in our body. It needs a lot of concentration. That's why after you, you eat uh, a full meal, what do you feel? You feel sleepy, right? After a full meal, usually you feel sleepy. Why? Because this guy, this stomach guy, tell the brain guy that, hey, dude, I need to collect the energy to break the molecule of this food to transform it into blood and energy for our whole body. But you use a lot of energy up here. Please take a rest so I can collect the energy and transform this food for you, for all of us. That's why you feel sleepy. That's the message of our body. But the nowadays society, the, our habit, force us to ignore that information, ignore that alert. If you feel sleepy, coffee. Another cup of coffee. So one day, you can drink four or five cups of coffee. Why you need that much? Because you never pay attention to what our body wants to tell us. That's why after you always feel exhausted. Because we're not silent enough to listen to what is happening. We're not aware enough, we're not mindful enough of what's happening inside here. So eating in silence is very luxury and very scientific. If you love your body, 
Please do that. Please do that to your body. We really need that. And uh, we eat in silence for 20 minutes. And we will not leave a hall even you finish your meal. Just be with the energy of the Sangha. Be mindful of your digesting system, of the spiciness of the food here, uh, the heat around you, around you. Just aware of it. And then when the two more sound the bell and we can all leave the hall, if you still feel found yourself hungry, you can serve more and eat more. But please sit in this hall alone. Don't come to the, the hut out there. It looks beautiful, but it's very hot. <laughs> Don't be fooled by your eyes alone. And sit with the Sangha in our mindful meal. After that, you can enjoy anywhere. But for the schedule, please sit in this hall. Okay? Thank you. And uh, the last but not least is the, the noble silence. Noble silence time that usually we have from after the activity in the evening, maybe 9, maybe 9.30. There will be the sound of the bell invite for us to know this is the noble silent time. And we practice no talking until after the breakfast first, after you wash your bowl in the next morning. We have eight, nine hours of being silent. We all know what is silence, right? We know, all know what is silence, but what makes a silent noble? What makes a silent noble? Because that is the time for the practitioner to gather all of his energy, all of his focus and concentration, to discover himself or herself, the true nature of himself or herself, the true nature of his or her feeling, his or, or her mental formation, his or her body, his or her perception. Really understand what it is happening and why this thing happened. That's a process, that's a time for discovery. And that discovery can liberate us from our own suffering. Liberate other people from their suffering. That's why that's silent called noble. And sometimes in Buddhism we even call it thundering silent. Silent but very contentive. That silent can break through the illusion, can break through the suffering, the loneliness, the jealousy. That's a very precious time, so I hope that we can make use of that time. You don't need to use your phone too much on that time. You don't need to, to chit-chat too much on that time. If you really need to say something to somebody, you can speak it quietly and gently, so we will not disturb the other practitioners. But make use of that time. And um, I believe that is uh, all the practice I need to share with you today so that we can practice together to maintain a, the awareness of how much precious your life is right now, despite of all the social condition, despite all the feeling that you have right now. You already have a lot, a lot more than you need to be happy. Don't need, you only need to be aware of it. Just, just be aware of it. Yes, uh, maybe we need to hear one more sound of the bell.
So dear friends, we have uh, five days together. It's not long, but it takes you a lot of effort to come here, right? And a lot of money too. You have to be in travel for many, very far away to arrive here. So please make use of these five days. It doesn't mean that you, you have to be so serious that you cannot find your smile smiling or, or joy at any time. It's always here in the wake-up retreat. It's always joyful. But beside that joyful, save yourself some time to be the one who discover, to take the, on the journey of discovering yourself. And this, if you can make good use of it, it can change your life forever. And uh, in order to support each other, there's a few uh, notice that uh, the organizing would like to share with you. So when you come in and out in this meditation hall with 300 people, plus the monastic, so we may have 400 pair of shoes and sandals. And it can be a chaos if we are not aware of it. And maybe one day you go, went out of the meditation hall and you cannot find your shoes. So please put your shoe neatly. Put your shoe neatly. This is not, not just a rule, but you can practice mindfulness with how you put your shoes, how you put your mind before you enter the meditation hall. That can be the meditation already. And uh, I know nowadays the fashion, the style of clothing is very, uh, is a wide spectrum. But, <laughs> but in the monastery, even Plum Village is very open, but it's still a monastery. So please wear a proper cloth. Please don't wear short or wear the, the cloth is too tight to your body. Give your body a chance to breathe, and uh, you will not distract other people. Okay. So um, and uh, you have a. We will. Yes, I think that's all. That's all I need to to remind you about the regulation. And. Uh, I hope that uh, you can enjoy the time you're staying here together. Ah, one more thing, one more thing. Just one more thing. That yesterday after all the registration, the brother and sister in the registration team uh, would like to say sorry to all of you. because there are wrong informations. That on the website, we said that the day for you, you can leave is on the 6th. But somehow in the email, there's the option for the 5th afternoon. But that, we still had a retreat on that day, and that evening, afternoon, that's the most uh, mesmerizing. Time for our wake up retreat. This time we have food fair, we have performance night. All the family practice performance and come to, to, uh, to enjoy the performance of each other. It's very joyful and tasteful also. So if you, uh, if you can replanning your, your schedule, please stay with us. Please stay with us to enjoy that, that moment together. But if you really have to go, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, if you want to change your mind, want to change your plan, the time you leave the monastery, tomorrow after breakfast, please go to the information board. There will be brother and sister in the registration team there. So you can, can tell them that you want to change to stay. And we can all leave on uh, Friday morning. Thank you, everyone.